Welcome to the Language of the Prophets series. Today we're discussing Torah portion by Yeshiv, and we will be covering the first Aliyah, the first reading. The first Aliyah can be found in Sefer Preshit, that's the book of Genesis, chapter 37, verse 1 through verse 11. Yeshiv Yaakov Eretz Megure Aviv So the first word it's it's actually Yod Shin Beit Yasha which is to sit or to dwell. Like we have the commandment to dwell in the sukkah during Sukkot. But the sages interpret it to mean that the mitzvah has been fulfilled as long as you sit and have a meal in there, since it's the same verb that's used. So yeshiv means something like he dwells or he will dwell. And since we have a vav conversive on the front, it means and he dwelled. So I would translate this probably, so Yaakov dwelled, or then Yaakov dwelled, the eretz migre aviv. So here we have a nice construct chain. Let's just mark it. It's all three of these words. Pretty good sized chain there. So Eretz means a land. Migurei Aviv, the root from this is Guo, the verb Guo. And there are two verbs that look identical from Guo. One means to sojourn, like to dwell temporarily. Uh, and the other one means to terrify, or to be terrified. That's probably not this one. <laughs> it's not the land of the terrifications of his father. So, since the last word has a pronominal suffix here, the vav, his father, that makes it not any old father, but specifically his father. So that means that the entire construct chain must then be definite. This word is definite. And so is this word, because they all are part of the same chain. So we have to say, in the land of the sojournings of his father. The Eretz cannot, and then the text specifies exactly which land. In again, it's another construct chain, actually. Might as well mark it. Kanaan is definite. It's not any old land. It has a name now. So, because it's definite, it makes the entire chain definite. In this case, it's just two words in the chain. So, Canaan spreads his definiteness over here. So, in the land of Canaan. First bait, two. Eile toledot Yaakov Yosef ben Sheva Esrei Shama Hayavo e et echaiv batzon vahum ar et bene. Bilha let the ne zilpa meshe aviv. That is a long clause. Ele, this is your demonstrative, demonstrative pronoun, plural. These, and usually with, with, pardon me, demonstrative adjective. With adjectives, you remember the order in Hebrew usually is noun first. Well, let me write up here. Noun followed by adjective. That's how we usually see it unless we're expressing something slightly different or showing emphasis, right? If you reverse the, the order and you put the adjective first, that's forming a predicate sentence, right? You want to say something is something else, right? If you have the adjective first and then the noun, okay? So these are, we have to substitute English are here, the Toledot, the genealogies or the generations. This comes from the word Yalad, Yod, La, Med, Dalit, to be born. And again, we've got another construct situation here, so you really got to know your constructs. The Toledot of Yaakov. So again, since Yaakov is definite, it makes the, and that means it's not any old Ish, it's not just a man, he's Yaakov. We know who he is, he's definite. It makes the entire chain definite. So we have to say V. So these are the generations of Jacob. And here they come. Yosef ben Sheva Esrei Shana Haya Ohei Et Echa Batzohon Vehu Na Na Av Ben Nei 
זילחה, ופני זילפה משי אביב. So Yosef, who was literally the son of seven and ten, right? So that's seventeen shana year. So that means he was seventeen years old. Haya, he was. Remember, think like Yoda. Son of seventeen years, he was. Yes. Okay, ro a a shepherd. Or shepherding, ro a chayv, his, his brothers. Hotzon, with sheep. The who ma'ar, but he was a na'ar, a lad. Who else now is being shepherding? Is he shepherding? So he's shepherding. Here's the et. So the et. Let me change color. Red. So our verb is. Our verb in this particular case is uh, well. We start with haya, right? So haya is actually giving us a story, right? And um, uh, and it's. It's, uh, and then it's followed by the participle of a, right? There's a participle. So it can actually mean a shepherd, so he was a shepherd. Uh, or if, it's probably that's, I think that's better than how I interpreted it before, so I'm going to make a correction. So just, you have to infer, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph was 17 years old. Okay? Haya Roe, he was a shepherd. And then in this case, et, it's probably not um, the definite direct object marker. Uh, in this case, it's probably something more like uh, with, right? There's another word that looks just like the direct object marker that means with. So it's, it's namely, it's eat, and it takes on this form when you have a makkaf afterwards. So, so he was a shepherd with, we have this pranamal suffix, vav, so his, ach, his echav, his brothers, batzon, with sheep, vahulnaar, but he was a lad, with bene bilha, the children of bilha, Vet b'nei Zilpa and the children of the sons of Zilpa, Nishay Aviv, and we have another nice construct chain there. Nishay is from Nashim. Nashim means women, women, and then the Aviv has the pronominal suffix, right? So that's his father. So once we've identified with the pronominal suffix that it's his. Then that means it's definite. It's not somebody's father, it's Joseph's father. And so this makes the whole chain definite. So we have to say the women or the wives of his father, or his father's wives. So this is Ba. Okay. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate, of course. So what's happening next? Uh, in this case, ba is in the he fill. It's a little bit hard to recognize. But what you have is there would have been a little yod right here, and we would have had a a, 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 a chirik, a single dot here, a short vowel. But what happens is oftentimes when you have a, a fairly light sound at the end of a he fill construct, of a he fill binyan, the yod goes away. And we have compensatory lengthening. The short single dot here lengthens to the double vowel, which is a long vowel, tsere. So, vayave is he feel. So, he caused to come, right? You know, ba, baruch ba, b'shem avalai. So, vayave. So, so, and Yosef brought, direct object marker, et. See, it looks just like the with there. Dibatam. So, here's a pronominal suffix, the am. Am meaning theirs, right? So, this word is actually diba. Diba. So, ends with a hey. So, dalit, bait, hey. And diba is a bad message, a bad news, like a bad report, an evil report. And so, but Yosef brought their bad report, right? It's the evil report about them. This is what's implied here. What kind of bad report? Ra'a, an evil one, okay? Just to make sure the text is telling us it's not a good thing. El unto avihim. Unto him is pronominal suffix. There of, unto their father. Verse Gimel 3. By Yisrael, ahav et Yosef mikol banayv ki venzekumim hu lo. Now, this you could either interpret it as and, 
Or I think it's fair game to also, also interpret this as the evolve emphaticum, right? Like the exclamation point. Syntax tells. It certainly works to do it this way. To tell it. It's like that upside down exclamation point in Espanol. So, Yisrael loved Yosef more than all his brothers. Literally, Mikol, this is how we do comparison in Hebrew. You say me, so this is from mean, right? Meaning from. Mm. And the noon, as noon often does, has assimilated. He's down there in the kaf, right? That's what's happening. So Mikol, from all Banav, his brothers, more than all of his brothers, right? Ki, because ven zekulimhu lo. Again, you think like Yoda. The son of old age is he. Okay, so he was, you have to say was to make it sound good in English, the ben zekulim, the son of old age, lo, to him, meaning to Yaakov. The asa lo ketonet pasihim. Okay, so he made for him a ketonet pasim, and that's a, another construct chain. Ketonet of Pasim. Because Pas is our word. And so it's kind of strange to have it in this plural form. So it seems to indicate of materials of Pas-like qualities. That's why I identified it as a construct here. So Ketonet, this is a tunic, right? Some kind of clothing, long clothing of Pasim. And here is where it gets mysterious. Traditionally, this is translated as a coat of many colors, right? And the tradition is because of this word, palikos, in, in the Septuagint, how it was traditionally translated, which then affected the Vulgate, which also translated it this way. So they translate this as many colors. That's the Greek and Latin tradition. The problem is there's really no justification for translating pas as multicolored, right? There, there's, especially more than any other possible interpretation. So it's pas is a disputed meaning. In Jewish Aramaic, it means the palm or the hand, uh, pardon, the palm of the hand or the sole of the foot. I meant to put a little slash there. Oops. Or the sole of the foot, right? So kind of like a kaf in Hebrew, like the kaf, it's the palm area or the, or the sole area. So then a long garment, right? I'm referencing my own book there, if you don't mind that. You can see that in my Genesis look again, a new translation with notes, right? You can see there on page 178. And I actually go into some more explanations there. Um, this, this word it actually, actually occurs in an Ugaritic document. We see this phrase, um, lavash pasim. Unfortunately, it doesn't give us any more insight because of the context. But this is also in the Bible in another place. It shows up in the book of Samuel. And it's actually a description of what princesses, right? Like the daughter of a king would wear, these long gowns. That they would wear. And interestingly enough, there's even an Akkadian word, but very similar. I can't remember what it is offhand, but it's very, very similar. You can tell it's a cognate. And uh, the Akkadian word, well, the cuneiform word, it actually means, uh, uh, well, it was this type of long gown that was, that was put on statues of a goddess, right? So again, very interesting. And uh, there's there's also some Egyptian background to this, and there's some there's some various explanations about how this can be other things and what it can be. And if you want to get more into this, uh, check out my drash coming up the Shabbat. Uh, I'll go into I'll explore the different etymologies of this word and the different backgrounds. And uh, probably one of my favorites is that they found that uh, the the Egyptians referenced that the Hyksos would wear a garment like this and. It, it oftentimes had pieces of gold or silver sewn into it, like a kind of like a, a tapestry of precious items sewn all together. So for now, we'll just stick with the Aramaic understanding. It was a very long robe. And if we go with that, it's interesting because this, this it seems to indicate the value in that it was seamless, right? Or nearly seamless. It was long cut of fabric. And we see this also. Yosef HaTzadik in many ways is a type of the Mashiach, right? We see his life, the suffering, the redemption of his of his family, right? Of Israel, all of Israel, basically, right? 
uh, as is written in the Mishnah, all Israel will be saved, and Rav Shaul references all Israel will be saved, right? And this is this is through Mashiach ben Yosef, right? The suffering Mashiach, the Mashiach who that is written about by our sages that would have to come and suffer for his people. And it's interesting that when Yeshua has been executed and he's on the execution stake, that the goyim that are around him, remember they gamble for one of his garments, right? They cast lots for it. They didn't want to tear it up because it was a complete piece of fabric. So in the ancient Near East, this concept of a, a one-piece fabric garment that's big, that had a lot of value to it. Plus the material, of course, is very good. And so I wonder sometimes if maybe this was in reference to like an echo, a prophetic echo, an echo of Nebua about Ketonet Pasim that Yosef HaTzadik wore. Verse 4, Dalet. Vayelu, okay. Vayu echayv, ki oto Yeah, understandable. So this is ra'a. The, it's a lamed he verb. The he has fallen away. So the root is resh, aleph, and he, which of course, you should know this word, or ought to see. So, yir'u means they see continuously, or they will see, right? In poetry, it could mean they saw, they were seeing. But here we have our, our friend, da 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 the vav, consecutive, or vav, whatever you want to call it, the, the flux capacitor vav. So, and... Chayv, pronominal suffix, his brothers saw, ki, that, oto, and this is interesting, I have this color-coded, maybe you can figure out why I have a color-coded here in a second, oto ahav, that him loved avihen, their av, their father, mikol echav, then all of his brothers. Okay. Sorry, my, my laptop did something weird there. So why do you think I have the color coding there? Did you figure it out? In Tanakhit, the proper grammar is usually like this. Like usually we have we have verb, right? And then we'll have subject, okay? And then we have object. Usually, that's like the most standard. Say 80% of the time things are happening this way, going right to left, yeah? Indirect object can slip in there even after the verb, you know? Like Lee, like he gave to me, right? Something it can slip in right there. The I O, the indirect object. So if you swap the order, if the object changes the game and decides that it wants to come first over object over here, your translation needs to show emphasis. This is how biblical Hebrew emphasizes the object by changing the word order. Okay, it needs to be reflected somehow in your translation. So that's why I color coded this. So literally, it's for it is him, i.e., more than them, it is him whom their father loved, right? So it gives a little bit more oomph to their feelings, right? They really, it's, he's the one who was really loved, right? More than them. And now we see who we have our oto again here. Nice, he, nice parallelism there. So, sana means to hate. Yis ne'u means they hated, and pronunciation is yis ne'u, because you have two schwas in a row. When that happens, the first one is what? Silent, and the second one is vocal. So, vayis ne'u. And then, so yis ne'u means they will hate him, or they hate him. Pardon me, they will hate, or they hate. But the vav changes the time, and makes it past. So, and they hated him. Velo yachalu dabaro. Le shalom. And not Yachalu, Yachal is to be able to, right? To be able. So they were unable. And this is an interesting setup here, this word, this Dabaro, Dabaro. So it's from Medaber to speak, right? This is a, a participle from speak. And uh, I'm just going to read to you from a commentary from Sarna and JPS about this. So it's unique, right? This particular setup, Dabaro. Usually, the suffix attached to a verb carries a possessive sense, right? So, for example, his speech. So the passage would then be translated, 
they could not abide his friendly speech. It's implying even his friendly speech. Of course, Sarna is stretching a bit with the friendly there, but I think, I think he might be right on with what's being implied by the text. Like even his friendly speech, they couldn't abide. In other words, they rebuff every attempt by Joseph to be friendly even. That's by the great scholar Sarna. And I think that's a nice insight into this word, why it is this way. It's, you know, we do see in poetic literature that sometimes a suffix can be used datably, right? Like to speak to him, right? So, but it's, in Torah, we don't see this so much. So I think Sarna might have something there. How? Le shalom, in peace. Peacefully, right? Verse hey. Okay. So chalom is to dream. Okay. And the noun is chalom. So to dream a dream. So ya chalom means he will dream, he dreams. Vayachalo means, and he dreamt. So, and, subject, Yosef dreamt. What did he dream? Chalom, a dream. Vayaged le echayv. Okay, so this word, a little bit harder to recognize. It is a pay noon verb. Noon. So, and don't worry, you get used to these after a while. Like, you know, when you read it, you won't even be thinking about it eventually. You just see it and you just understand. And I wish that on anyone listening. If, if Hashem wills it, I, I would like to impart that to anyone who's listening, that you'll get to this phase where you can really enjoy the Hebrew you're just reading, and you're not thinking in English, or Tagalog, or Ruski, or whatever your language is, and you'll just have it. You'll have that text, and you will get there. You absolutely will, as long as you stick with it, even if it seems hard. Just keep going, bit by bit, even if, God forbid, in the worst, busiest times in life, you're reduced to five minutes a day. Do your five minutes. Maintain and move forward and you will get there. Rabbi Akiva was 40 years old when he learned to read Hebrew. Can you imagine? He was 40, and he's generally considered by Jews to be the greatest rabbi of all time. Of course, we would probably contend with that and say HaMashiach Yeshua would be the greatest, but that's fine. Let's say the greatest non-Messiah rabbi of all times. So Nagad, this is to relate, to tell. And as I mentioned before, it's related to the word Hagada that we use in the Pesach. Seder, right? The, the Haggadah is the retelling, right? The telling. So, Yaged, see, originally was Yan Ged in, in ancient Hebrew. And then at noon, he comes inside. And he, that's what the dot is telling us. He's saying, hey, there's a noon hiding out in here. So, Yaged, he will tell, or he, or he tells, he relates, Va Yaged, and he told. And by the way, this is really nice, this characteristic of biblical Hebrew that so often, for sure you've seen by now, we have this vav consecutive form. We have vav and followed by the verb, right? It's all over the place. And if you ever get an inkling to study Koine Greek, and you read the apostolic writings in Koine Greek, you're going to notice the same thing. Kai. It'll be this word, Greek. Kai. Kai or day, usually kai. Kai. Meaning and. And it's interesting because in classical Greek, this was not really the norm, the style for writing. Just like in English, it's technically incorrect to begin a sentence with a conjunction, with and or but, right? Sometimes we have to, with some of these Hebrew sentences, bring them in. It's just, it gets too awkward if you don't, uh, or, you, or you feel like you're deviating from the text too much, yeah? But uh, in the Koine Greek of the Apostolic Writings, it happens all the time. Some of the books, it's like 76%. Of the sentences begin this way. So you can tell that there really is a Hebrew underpinning, or at least I could say a Semitic underpinning to, to what is written in the Greek. All right. So, and he related, and we'd, we'd infer it, even though it's not there, it, le, to, le, achiv, echaiv. It becomes echaiv because it's impossible. The vav, his, Achim, his brothers, can you imagine? <laughs> he tells the dream to his brothers. Vayosifu <laughs> Okay, and this is kind of a nice play on words here. I'm going to use a highlighter to show it to you. I think it's great. Look at this. Yosifu. Yosif. What's that sound like to you? 
<laughs> so I think the text is being a bit playful here. Maybe it's because of his name, you know. So Yosifu is they added, or it can mean they continued, right? They increased, or they will increase rather. And then of course we have our Bob consecutive. So it's and they continued or and they added, they increased. Od still or more semaoto. We end that verse with a construct chain. Sino oto. Hatred of him. The hatred of him. Here we are at verse Shesh or six. By the way, I should mention that Kimchi says that the reason why Yosef told them the dream, Kimchi believes it was to hurt them. So that's there was an interesting dynamic and Surely you've seen this in relationships, right? Sometimes if someone is rejected and rejected and rejected, well, then they just play the role. Fine, I'm going to hurt you too. Let's have this brawl out. Verse Vav. Vayomer alehem. And he said to them, Shimuna ha-chalom hazeh, asher halamti. Shimu, this is an imperative form. Imperative, meaning command form. It's a plural masculine imperative. He's talking to a group of fellas. So he says, listen now. It could be please. He could be being polite, but I don't think so. Listen now. Hachalom, the dream, haze, the this one, right? So we have our noun. We have our adjective. They're both definite with the definite article. Ha, as they should be. They have to agree with each other. Ha. And they're both masculine. Ha, chalom, haze. Literally, the dream, the this one. Asher, which chalamti, which I dreamt. Verse Zion. Vehine Kama Alumati Nitsava. Okay. Behold, we were Me Alamim. This is the only place this is in the Bible. It's a hapak sagamemnam. And it, it's the PL form of this root Aleph Lamed Mem 2, and it means to bind. And there's a little bit of a play on words with it. What do you bind? You bind sheafs, right? Me alamim alumim. We were binding sheafs. And the reason I say were here, I insert the English were, is because we already established chalamti, I dreamt. So we know the dream is in the past tense, so we would put past tense here. If future tense made more sense, we would just infer that for English as well. Betoch hasade in the midst of the field. Behine, and look, Kama, there was standing, or stood up, Kama, Alumati, my Aluma, right? So Aluma, you look over here, it ends in a He. But when you put a suffix on the word, you put it in the construct state. And what is the construct of a feminine word? If the feminine word ends in a He, the He becomes a Tav. So when you put a suffix on, you've got to put it in that ancient Hebrew form. It used to be that it just ended in Tav in ancient times, before the Bible. And so, uh, where is he at? Ulamati, this is Ulama, like Ulama Shali, they'd say, right? <laughs> if it was more modernized. Alumati, my sheaf. Vegam nitzava, and also it took its stand, it took its place. And again, you remember, as I've shared with you before, in the Mechilta, the Rabbi Shimon, Shimon Bar Yochai, we learn that when you see Natsav in the Torah, usually it's an indication of the presence of Ruach HaKodesh. Right? So Ruach HaKodesh is present clearly in the dream, and this is a nice indicator that the dream is in fact prophetical. Because he could have just said, Amada, right? That would have meant standing, but it took its stand, or it's standing, with this nuanced hint about Ruach HaKodesh being present. Vehinehi, and behold! Tesubena, so this is a bit harder. This is from Savav, which is to surround. So, and it's a feminine form. So, alum, alumotechem, so pronounce suffix, chem, you alls, y'alls in southern Hebrew. <laughs> y'alls, y'alls almot. Tesubena almotechem. Batishtach vena almote. Okay, so again, I, I'm, I love southerners, so don't take it as mockery. I just like the way the accent sounds. And actually, you wouldn't believe, but it's the 
the way that I speak when I'm tired. So, so I'm kind of making fun of myself. All right. So, you all's sheaves surrounded. Batishtachavena. So this is a plural feminine ending. You might not be too used to. If you're not used to seeing the feminine endings, read the book of Ruth. Ruth is pretty easy. It might be the easiest book in the Tanakh to read uh, if you're familiar with the feminine endings because they're all over the place because it's about Ruth, right? Ruth and Naomi. So Tishtachavena means they, pro they, they prostrated down, right? In this case, we're not getting a... Uh, um, there's no vow of consecutive action happening. It just And they prostrated down. La alamoti, to my sheaf, to my aluma. Nachmanides, oops, I misspelled his name, Nachmanada, Nachmanides. Nachmanides writes that Yosef was shown in his dream that the sheaves of grain would be the cause of his brothers bowing down to him. Like, that's the reason why sheaves were the thing, right? It's about grain, right? They're hungry in the future, and so... He had had this insight according to Nachmanides. Verse 8. Verse eight. Vayomru lo echayev. Hamaloch timloch aleinu? Im mashol timshol banu? Yeah, they're, they're ticked. <laughs> so they said to him, his brothers, so subjects way over here, take note of that. If you're getting used to searching for subjects. Like I said before, the indefinite object, the lo, it can sneak in there right if the verb likes to do that. Vayomru lo chayv, and said to him his brothers, Ha! So this, you might not be so familiar with this guy. This is the, the hey interrogative. Hey interrogative. So it's a question marker. Right? And there he is. So maloch timloch, this is the uh, infinitive absolute. And so I've mentioned before, when you have two verbal forms, and you want to say, like, indeed, like, really? You take the same verb you're talking about, and you put it in the infinitive absolute, and you put it before the other verb. So, maloch timloch. Timloch means you will reign. It's the imperfect. You will reign, talking to a man. Maloch means really? And it has to be used with itself, right? So the only one that sometimes floats around with other verb forms is haloch, right? Like, and it has the idea of, like, to keep on going, to keep on doing whatever. So, so question mark. Will you really reign all over new pronomen suffix new over us? Imashol tim shol banu na im is a bit harder to pin down in the syntax here. Oftentimes this word means if, right? But it's it's just following on with the idea of, of ha, like really? Like indeed? Mashol tim shol. So again, see the same thing? Maloch tim loch, mashol tim shol. See, even the vowels are the same. You get the exact same pattern going on with these two words. So this is a good thing to get used to. Seeing, maybe I'll color code them. Maloch and Mashol. See how the vowels are the same? They're both infinitive absolutes, so they're following the pattern. Will you indeed Mashal Bano? So Mashal plus Bait is idiomatic, it means to rule over, uh, to rule over us. Will you indeed rule over us? Vayosifu od seno oto al chalamotayv ve al bivarayv. So they continued still the hatred of him. Right? Construct chain. Al because or concerning chalamotayv his chalamot. Chalamot means dreams, and then this is our vav pronomal suffix his. The al and because of devarav his words. And I can't remember one of Chazal. They say that the words, that the dream is the dreams, and the words refers to his dibatam ra'a that we learned about before the wicked, the bad reports that he gave his father about them. I think it's the Rashbam who says that. I'm not sure. I think Rashbam. Pretty sure. Pretty sure. Verse Tet nine. Nine, verse nine. Ve chalom od chalom acher, ve saper oto le chayv. Then, this one's going to be then, he dreams still, dream acher, another dream. Ve saper, and he related, he told oto it le 
Echayv to his brothers. Fast learner Yosef was. Vayomer, hinei, chalamti chalom, od, vehinei, hashemesh, vehayareach, veachad, asa kochavim, mishtachavim li. Yeah, a little too excited. <laughs> and, he, and he said, behold, look, chalamti, I dreamt, chalom, a dream, od, still, like another one. Vehinei, and behold, the sun, hashemesh, the sun, vehayareach, and the moon, the Achadasa, that's an eleven kochavim, stars, mishtachavim, prostrated down, li, to me. Yeah. <laughs> it's maybe one of the worst times to share a dream in the history of, of, of the world. And uh, it's, it's interesting, though, from his excitement, the Bechor Shor deduces that that Yosef HaTzadik actually realized that one day the entire world would prostrate down to him, right? Beyond just these stars and stuff, that he already understood this meaning of the dream from the dream. And so it could just have innocent wonderment, right? Like maybe he doesn't mean any malice from this particular sharing, but, uh, but according to the Bechor Shah, he knew what it meant, and he knew that everybody's going to prostrate down to him. And of course, you have to understand that the biblical text, the writing style, when it says everyone, everything, the whole world, all the people, the Hebrew code, all doesn't convey the same sense, at least biblical Hebrew, as it does in, in other modern languages, right? So it doesn't mean literally everyone. So if you're an atheist or otherwise agnostic listening to this, you can't say, wait a second, the Chinese didn't come down and bow down to, to Joseph in Egypt, right? Okay. The text usually is referring to the influence that's around it, right? So... And this, you'll see this. I mean, it's so clear, like the example of Eliyahu Hanavi when he slays the 400 prophets of Baal and the people shut up. Adonai huha Elohim. Adonai huha Elohim. Right? And, uh, and, and then it says, all the people shut it out. Okay, so really, all the people? The little babies? Go, go, gaga. Adonai huha Elohim. Go, go, gaga. Right? You know, of course not. You have to, there's a way of storytelling that the text uses, and this does not make the text any way inferior to any other text. It's just you have to understand the language and the style and the culture in which these stories were shared, right? And so use that in your proper hermeneutic to not say, no, it says every, it says all. That's a false hermeneutic. You have to understand from the perspective of the prophet who's writing it what this word is nuanced to mean in Tanakhit, even if it might have a different meaning in Ivit Chadashat today, in modern Hebrew, okay? And a lot of people, they get confused because they study the modern Hebrew and then they approach biblical Hebrew and they try to make biblical Hebrew, they think it's the same, right? And yeah, they're related, they're close, but uh, they're, they're also not close. Sometimes it's even better to not have had the modern Hebrew, right? So you don't get confused and think something says something that doesn't say, right? Instead, approaching the text with wonderment, right? Okay. Vayomer, and he said, Hinei chalam tichalom od, vahinei hashemesh vahirech v'achad asa kochavim mishtachavim li. Verse Yod, verse 10. Okay, we'll stop there. He's getting chastised. Okay, where were we? Okay. Saper, we mentioned this before, it's to relate, to tell. This is where we get the word sefer from, like book or sofer or scribe, right? Someone who's doing the telling. So, yes, saper, he will tell. Vaisaper and he told. And he told El Aviv to his his father, the El Echaiv, and to his brothers. Vayik Abo. Ga'a is to rebuke, to correct, right? But his father, subject, corrected Bo him. Vayomer, and he said lo to him. Ma, what? Hachalom haze, what is this dream? Asher Chalamta, which you dreamt. Havo navo ani v'mecha v'achecha l'shtachavot l'cha aretzah. So ha again, we have our our question mark word there, right? The hey interrogative. Bo navo. So ha bo navo. So we have also the the pattern that I showed you on the previous page. This is an a, a, uh, infinitive absolute. So, shall indeed, navo, we come? Shall indeed we come? 
I and your mother, your mother, the and Achecha, your brothers, Leish Tachavot, to prostrate down, Lecha to you, Atsa, Helakadiv, towards the Eretz, towards the ground. And I wonder when I read this if his father is just kind of putting on a show, like the brothers need to see him being rebuked, right? Because we're later told, well, you'll see, we're later told. <laughs> Verse Yod Aleph, that's 10 plus Aleph, 10 plus 1. Why can Uvo Echaev? Okay, Kanna is to be jealous, right? Like where Hashem reveals himself in the Aser Davrot as El Kanna. I am El Kanna, a zealous or a jealous God. So Yek Kanna'u is they will be jealous. The Vav makes it and they were jealous. Who's the subject? Echaev. So and his brothers were jealous. Bo. Literally it means against him, right? That's how Hebrew expresses it. Beit can mean in, but also means against, right? To make a battle against the city, etc. Well, even his brothers, Shamar, oh, pardon me, pardon me, his brothers, <laughs> Aviv, but his, his father, Shamar, kept et hadavar, he kept the thing, he stored it up. And again, we have more connections um, to the rabbinical method of Gazel Shava. If we take this wording and we trace it through the Septuagint to see the Greek word and bring that to the Apostolic writings, then who keeps the thing in their heart? The mother, Miriam, kept the things in her heart, right? She stored up the things in her heart. And so again, I think it's another nice little prophetical, metaphorical hinting about Yeshua HaMashiach, that he would fulfill the role in the first coming, not as Mashiach ben David, but actually as Mashiach ben Yosef, the suffering Mashiach. And uh, I'll read you this comment here from the Talmud. This is Talmud Tractate Berachot, very important tractate in the Talmud. Page 55, at the bottom of A to the top of the back page. So A is the first page, first side of the page, and B means the back side of the page. So on a similar note, Rabbi Berachia said, even though... Okay, so let me, let me summarize first. What this is talking about is, uh, you'll notice that the dream isn't fully fulfilled. And this is something really important to learn about interpreting dreams. If you believe that, that Elohim is sending you Nebuah in a dream, right? Prophecy in a dream or something like this or a warning or whatever, then it's important when interpreting the dreams to not be so tied down to the specifics of it, right? So uh, we have an example here. The, the father is upset. He says, what? Ani ve imecha, I and your mother will come and bow down to you. But what happens when Yosef has this dream already? What's, what happens? Or rather, what happens in the future, I should say? What happens? when they come down to Egypt. Rachel's not alive, right? This part of the dream doesn't happen. The moon, the Yareach, which is supposed to symbolize the mother in those times. The sun is the father, the moon is the mother, the stars are the siblings, right? Or the other hosts, right? So the mother never does prostrate herself down to him, right? So the dream is not precise. So I think it's important to understand the nature of prophecy in many dreams as being imprecise, right? And that's, that's the only tip. <laughs> I'm going to give, and here the Talmud comments it out, uh, points it out. So even though part of a dream is fulfilled, all of it is not fulfilled, right? So it's possible for part of a dream to be fulfilled and not all, because the continuity of the dream, it was important to not make it strange. If the mother was removed, then he might have missed the whole pattern of the sun and the stars and this sort of thing. From where do we derive this? From the story of Yosef's dream, as it is written, and he said, Behold, I have dreamed yet a dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars bowed down to me. And you might be wondering why are some words in bold and some are not. This is Rabbi Aiden Steinsaltz's translation. And uh, he does this to make... The Talmud is very terse. And it can be very difficult to understand what it's talking about until you get used to some of these patterns. And so what he does is he fills in the missing parts to make it easy. His, his translation's really wonderful. If you're going to buy a translation of the Talmud, uh, I recommend you skip Neusner's. Uh, and uh, do not get Rodkinson's, just horrible. Uh, it's free, of course, but don't get it. <laughs> if you're going to invest, you get, get a Steinsaltz edition. You could get the older Steinsaltz edition by Random Publishing House, uh, or you could get uh, the, the new Corin Talmud, which is the same translation. Uh, they actually, if you have the money, you have a real nice big one with beautiful color pictures and all the sorts of stuff. It's, it can be actually even like a family like heirloom. And if you're doing the Daf Yomi, you can subscribe and they'll send you one every... If you live in the United States or in Israel, it's free shipping, right? 
So that's nice if you do that program. Or you can get the PDFs if you don't care about having the nicely bound stuff. If you live elsewhere, shipping is crazy. And at this time, his mother was no longer alive, you see? So this is what the Talmud's pointing out. So according to the interpretation of the dream, the moon symbolizes Yosef's mother. Even this dream that was ultimately fulfilled contained an element that was not fulfilled, okay? So keep that in mind with dream interpretation, tracking dreams, if you, if you keep a dream journal or something like that. Okay, that's the end of the first Dalia. Have a great week. Um, pray for me that I can continue to knock them out, that we can have the full Torah portion knocked out every single week. I really want this resource out there for people. I feel this is something that Hashem wants available. For those of you who are kind of halfway in your Hebrew and you just want to dive in and really get it done. Okay? Shalom, shalom.